The Sea Caucus Library's rich history dates back to the early 1900s, as revealed by a 1914 newspaper ad for a movie night to raise funds for a library, as well as an improvised library located in the local newspaper office on Center Avenue. However, on August 23, 1934, a small group of educators, with the support of then Mayor John J. Kane, organized to form a public library for the town of Secaucus. In just six short months, March 18, 1935, the doors of a two-room library located on the very top floor of the old town hall opened with a very small budget, some new but mostly donated books, a volunteer staff, two tables, and 16 chairs. Mrs. Lieberman was the first librarian. Upon her resignation in 1941, she was replaced by assistant librarian Mrs. Marion Dudley, who would go on to become the unsung hero of that library. World War II turned the library's focus to the needs of returning servicemen and women. It also became the library's daunting responsibility to record and maintain the accurate history of the world. I became mayor in January, officially, 1964, and uh, I served 14 two-year terms. Is there anything you recall about the library in its first location at the top floor of the old town hall? Well, there was a lot of criticism because of the location. I can imagine. <laughs> and uh, the absence of uh, a real library. But in those days, Sea Corps didn't have much in the way of services. And, and uh, it wasn't as bad as you might think. And those people that were really library customers were, would do it and a lot of other people who would like to, like to do it didn't. And I, as uh, even though I was the mayor, I only made a couple of visits up to the library after it moved. I was never there while, while it was operating. Okay. Because uh, we had to, uh, we were digging for some old records. Mr. Kiefer, the executive director of the town there, and I, and for the first time, I saw what it looked like. It was a couple of rooms, not too big. <laughs> As I recall, the man that was on a night shift in the, in the town hall lived upstairs with his family. I know they had at least one son, and I'm not sure what the rest of the family was, but it was his job to, to be the night man downstairs. I don't think he had a police badge or anything like that. I'm not sure of that. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, the police took turns in working the night until, until one police would come along and preferred to work nights. And that was so. I have to tell you, Mayor, in all my years of doing research about the library, I never heard that story. Uh, so that was a unique perspective, as I said. For some reason, I, I, I have the name Gilbert, and possibly that was the last name of the family, but I can't be sure of that. I, we lived at the bottom of First Avenue, and uh, so there was a grade going up First Avenue and then over to Patterson Plank Road and another grade going up toward the town hall. And then when you got there, there were outside steps and then very heavy doors, as I remember. They seemed very heavy, at least when I was that age, probably around eight years old. Um, opened those and then you would go up a very wide staircase, which when you got to the second floor level became much smaller and narrower and wound around until finally you emerged into this, what I would call an attic, and I think that's what it was, in fact, an attic of this building. Um, well, the library, 
was an addict. And it's, so it had, it had a fascination, I think, to me, especially as a child, that this was a place of uh, uh, adventure, a place of growing up. Um, the library card was really a rite of passage uh, into a more um, adult life. And I remember treasuring that card that I was given that, uh, that said all that. There was responsibility, and there was uh, privilege, and there was uh, mystery up there in the attic. Books to be uh, explored, and stories to read, and a great place to be. Um, just going through there, uh, into the library, there was uh, Mrs. Dudley sitting behind her desk. That was the first encounter you had uh, with another person in the library. She was, uh, she was a, a, a very pleasant woman, uh, helpful, uh, but at the same time, no nonsense. I don't think you would, uh, you would make a whole lot of noise up there uh, and get away with it. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, she was very ancient at that point in time. She probably wasn't all that old, but she seemed very old to me. So the question kind of was, how did she get up here? Mm. It seems like it, it, it must have been a very difficult thing for her to get up and down all those stairs. But there she was, and she did her job quite well. Um, the, the place uh, was lined with bookcases, and um, because it was an attic, there were dormers, and there were uh, all these things to work around to install these bookcases. Um, but, but they did their very best to get as many books into that area as I think they could. And you know, what, when I think about the, the library, I, I'm sure I was up there sometimes when it was raining because I can sort of hear the, the pitter-patter of rain. I don't think there was a lot of insulation in that attic. You could hear the rain. I, I, you know, I'm sure it was very cold in the winter and hot in the summer for Mrs. Dudley, but I never heard her complain about that. So, um, you know, it was a place of mystery and delight and, and of uh, growing up, and a fun place to be. Well, I was about 17, 16 or 17 years of age when, if I remember, it was the first time, you know, okay? And, of course, they had the staircase, a lot of stairs. I wish I could climb them today, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, at then, it was no problem for me at all to go up those stairs, you know. And at the top of the stairs, to your right, was a small office and that's where the library was situated and mrs dudley was librarian at the time every memorial day was our uh, the parade would seem to end there so i remember and we would all gather in the town on the lot there it's all grass and very very nice yeah and the incident I remember is with my friend, Ann Wirtwood. And we had to go to high school out of Seek office, of course. And we were coming home, had to take two buses. Sometimes we walked, but mostly two buses. And then went to the library and we decided we're going to quit school. <laughs> so that was it. Now we got upstairs, Mrs. Dudley, of course, would ask, how our day went, as usual. So we answered to her in the sense that we were going home to tell our parents that we're quitting school. Well, she sat down. I cannot remember her words, but she talked to us and talked to her. Needless to say, neither one of us ever quit school. And ne ne neither did we ever tell our parents that we did. And any time after that, Anytime we, we had to use the library, of course, for look up things and that. And she'd say, how are you girls doing? And we'd tell her and we'd tell her what was going on. And we were getting more comfortable meeting friends, you know. Yeah, so that's why I was always against that we didn't have a, a high, school high school in town. When I entered the town hall, the first thing I saw and the first thing I remember were the stairs. There were three flights of stairs. The first flight was nice and wide. It was either a polished concrete or a marble, marble and polished concrete. 
but it was large enough for people to go up the stairway and down the stairway at the same time. And the town hall didn't have air conditioning. You might be surprised by that, but no one had air conditioning, not even the houses at that point in time. So as you were walking up this wide stairway with other people passing, it was getting hotter and hotter. And you'd get to the first landing, and you had the second set of identical stairways, another large stairway with people going up and down. And then I started to puff a little bit, you know, because now I'm going with the second, second flight of stairs. And I'm only nine years old, and I'm skinny, too, at the time. I'm, I'm getting ready for the next uh, staircase. And I go up the second flight of stairs, and by then I'm like really, you know, getting out of breath, and it's really hot. And then you turn, and you get the piece de resistance. You get this little spiral stairway. And again, I was only nine years old and very skinny, and I felt cramped on that. I have no idea how Mrs. Dudley climbed those three sets of stairs day in and day out. God bless her. Now, the room. The room, I call it the room because it was a room. And the, it was stuffy and hot, even stuffier and hotter than the stairway. And there was one desk and one chair. And there was standing room only because the walls around the perimeter of the room were from the ceiling, from the floor almost to the ceiling, and it was covered with books. And then in the open area in the center of the room, there were bookcases, standalone bookcases that were two sided and they were parallel to each other and they filled the entire center of the room. Again, I was only nine years old and I felt cramped going through those little aisles with the books. And there was standing room only, that's why, because it was so tightly packed. Mrs. Dudley ran a tight ship. There was no talking in the library. The only people that could talk is if anybody standing in front of Mrs. Dudley, Dudley's desk wanted an answer to a question or needed to be pointed out where to look for something. And Mrs. Dudley was always very happy and very helpful to help the people. And there would usually be, when I was there, maybe three or four people online, some children, some adults. And when I, I got to Mrs. Dudley's desk, I had asked her what I wanted, and again, she was very helpful. And she, had, she was like a grandmother figure, and that's how I re react to her, because she and my grandmother, I guess, at that time were about the same age. And uh, she was a very helpful, wonderful librarian. The one thing I do remember was I had an overdue book, and I had to pay two cents <laughs> as a fine and a penalty for this overdue book, and I cried because I thought it was a really bad person because I had this overdue book. The Old Town Library, Spiral Staircase, don't remember. Stairs, I do remember. I wasn't in school yet and went with my dear daddy on those special life-changing trips. But allow me to paint a picture of those times so you may grasp the importance of the Seacocus Library to me. My block was a dead-end street. Everyone knew everyone. Most moms stayed home. There were no cars on the block until 5 o'clock when all the daddies came home. Four other girls my age lived there, and all the old ladies were like our grandmas. One was my friend's spry German sweet grandma. I only saw my own grandma on Sundays, so these neighbor ladies were like family. And one by one, as they left this earth and my little life, I added them to my bedtime prayers. Tradition begun by my mom, Marie Balsamo. Mrs. Schultz had no grandchildren of her own. She was the first to pass away. She had blown me kisses on the way to kindergarten. Every morning, in the days when little girls were safe to walk alone to school or with only their little friends. She is first on my prayer list. Others followed, but number five is Mrs. Dudley, the town librarian. I hadn't thought about that list order or number, but when I saw the request asking for memories of the library, I did count. I've prayed her name every night for over half a century. She was like my book grandma. Once a week or so, we'd go up those stairs, spiral or not, and see Mrs. Dudley. I seem to recall there was a ladder of some kind, perhaps a rolling one, hooked on the shelves since the room was so small and the books seemed to me to be stacked quite high. But I was around four, 
so they were tall to me anyway. She wasn't too tall herself, and she had a ready, warm smile and white and gray hair pulled up in a bun. I remember that I couldn't get my own library card because I wasn't in school yet. My dad took out three books each time and saved his fourth selection for my pick. I think Mrs. Dudley always pulled five or six books for me to choose from. I don't recall going wildly through a shelf or taking three weeks to choose a book all by myself, which I would have done. I was known for getting thrown out of Corby's, my neighborhood candy store, for taking too long to decide what choices to make that added up exactly to 25 cents. So I'm pretty sure Mrs. Dudley did lay books out when she saw me. I didn't own a book or know any children that did own one. No bookstores, online stores, just the library. I owned my first book at 10 or 11 when I asked for a science book for Christmas. Those early library trips led to summers of reading with friends. There was the mystery summer, historical summer, biography summer. When I had nothing to read, I went crazy. I opened the bathroom cabinet and read the toothpaste tube. I read <laughs> soup cans in the kitchen. I've told this story to my own grandchildren. I tell it to every first grade, that, every first grade class that comes into my room at Huber Street. I want them to know that there were times when you didn't own books or electronic equipment to read them on. There were no book fairs or bookstores available to many people. It was just the library and you. If there were library programs, my parents were not aware of them, but Mrs. Dudley certainly did get me off to a running start all by herself. Those are structural features, the bones of the library, but I knew the heart. Mrs. Dudley, Secaucus Town, Library. Not long after the first library was established, it became evident that the quarters were too small. Although Mayor John J. Kane was sympathetic, it took 20 years to get the library firehouse facility built in Plaza Center. Under the tutelage of Director Margaret Grazioli, the library flourished with enhanced services, story hour, and the introduction of library school. In the 80s, the State Library mandated the purchase of videos to offer a new source of entertainment to patrons. A literacy program was also instituted to address the needs of the town's new multicultural community. During the tenure of Director Catherine Steffens, the library introduced new technology and entered into a consortium known as Buckles along with its computerized system of circulation. Mayor Anthony Just brokered an agreement providing the library with the use of the firehouse meeting room for special programs. In the old days, the town hall had the library up in the third floor and it had the firehouse, one of the fire, fire, fire companies, down to the main floor, the garage, which they share with an ambulance. And they had a little room that was there, a uh, meeting room, gathering room, whatever, uh, adjacent, which also the hallway for the policemen to come and go, for the employees to come and go. And at some point, uh, there was gonna be a need for a bigger, a newer, bigger fire engine uh, on the horizon. And there's no way they could fit that in the garage. They barely could fit the one they have. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was my understanding that the library and the fire department teamed up and petitioned the mayor and council to do something and join me. And I don't know who was the stronger voice at the time, mm -hmm. but I, I would guess it's possibly the fire department because Five minutes to be more popular than librarians. Uh, most uh, of did you want to step outside <laughs> and have a little fisticuffs now? Well, seriously, I, I think the, the five could gather more, you know, uh, uh, if you want to say recognition or whatever, uh, to their needs. But it worked out good because there's a piggyback effort on both parts. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess the property in the plaza was acquired. I don't know the details of that. And they built the uh, library firehouse. But when I was very small, I remember there was no street in front of the library. The fire engine had come out of uh, the firehouse door, crossed some gravel into the former Acme parking lot, which is now the CVS, and they used the parking lot as their exit and entrance to the firehouse. I do remember the back of the building was basically marsh and fill, and they used right. to have the carnivals every year in the back, and uh, they, you know, it's all, it all swampy back there. 
before Buckwell Park. Before Anthony Justin Mayer came to us and said, guys, the library needs more space. We're trying to build a new building, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know, that room's not used on a regular basis. Can we do something with it? And we felt, sure, why not? It's a town, it's a town room, it's a building. But we explained, hey, we do use it for training. We have meetings, uh, we have different events going up there, uh, fire management related. We have to, you know, work on agreements. Uh, you know, we would have priority on it. And uh, with that, they cut the hole in the wall. Found out that the library level was about a foot higher than the firehouse level. Oh, I was standing there. I'll never forget it. <laughs> and uh, put a ramp in and made it work. Make a long story short, uh, the library now had a lot of fun there. I think we had our history up on our, uh, our trophy cabinets, and I think that was an interesting part of the library experience to see that. It certainly was. You know, almost 100 years of uh, it's history. It's the first home. museum. Talking about Margaret Grazioli, I believe she saw her dream come to fruition. I believe she had a front row seat in heaven, along with some of the trustees that passed, that worked diligently on this project. This project went on since the day I was hired. First day I walked into the office in 1984, there was discussion about enlarging the library. Margaret and I were close friends before I became director. I mean, before I was hired, excuse me. She wanted me to be director from day one. She was writing notes and writing letters that I should follow in her footsteps. And she was most generous with sharing the history that she knew from her 30 years in the library. And since she didn't drive, I got a lot of time with Margaret to hear some of the history and some of the harrowing stories that some libraries went through. So she was my mentor, she was my friend, not just my employer. And I truly enjoyed working with her. Uh, she originally started as the children's librarian in Weehawken. She held that position for about five years. Uh, and then she went back to school and received her library di uh, director's uh, certificate and eventually became the director of the Weehawken Public Library. In those days, Weehawken and Seacoast were very close. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the Seacoast students went to Weehawken. Um, and um, the superintendent of schools in Weehawken and Seacoast um, corroborated on this, and they asked my mother to become the director in Seacoast, because Seacoast needed a director. At first, she said no because she was loyal to Weehawken. Uh, and then uh, she came out here, she saw the building, and she fell in love with it. And she wanted to be director in Seacoast. But Weehawken didn't want to let it go <laughs> that quickly. So they worked out a deal that uh, she would be the full-time director in Seacoast, but she would also be a member of the Weehawken Library Board so that they had someone with a director's certificate on the library board. This way they didn't have to hire uh, a separate director. And uh, so in name only she was director with, we, I remember driving her up there once a month for a board meetings. So that's how she, she pulled that off, director of both libraries. She completely renovated the children's department in Weehawken. And then when she came here, uh, she had the same motivation and um, started the story out, which was taking place uh, on the, in the Plaza Library on, on the bottom floor. And that expanded into library school, which for many years served as the preschool here in Seacorpus, because they actually didn't have a preschool in the public school system. Uh, there were like private preschools, but that was the, the preschool, and that was her pride and joy downstairs, the uh, children's uh, center of this library is, is dedicated in her name, the Margaret Grant yes, Children's is. Wing. Uh, and I think this is what she envisioned, or, or certainly something like this. Unfortunately, she was deceased by the time this library was built. But she envisioned a library like this. This is what she uh, perceived, this is what she pushed for, and it happened. And she, even though she had passed away, she was one of the uh, driving forces. And I think that's why the uh, town elders uh, chose to name uh, a wing of the library after her. And deservedly so. But, uh, but this is what she would have been. Many residents remember Mrs. Ruth McCormick and later Pat Santori 
and the favorite library song, Puff the Magic Dragon. My story here is, is just one of coming full circle. I'm a lifetime uh, resident of Sea Caucus, 53 years old now. At last year's end of the year program for the nursery school, we were talking about how long it's been in existence and whatnot. And I'm sitting up there thinking to myself, God, this is my 50th anniversary. Uh, I remember being in the old library and then Margaret Grazioli's tutelage in the, in the library school program there. I remember her very, very distinctly, you know, sitting down reading his books and whatnot. And I had Robin Hood and, oh gosh, uh, Daniel Boone all types of different stories for kids and one and I, I loved it and I wound up coming back to the library as often as I could and there's always stuff there that interests me. Coming full circle as far as Margaret Grazioli goes, I was a member, I'm still a member of the Masonic fraternity. We have a going across the street. Uh, we had an initiative while I was the master of lodge where we, uh, the Grand Lodge of the state of New Jersey wanted us to present an award to you know, outstanding citizen of the year. So, well, I'm whatever, 24, 25, I have no idea if you're an outstanding citizen in Sea Caucus. <laughs> so what do I do? I reach out to them, Mayor Amico. I said, Paul, what do you think here? He just says, Margaret Grazioli. Didn't even have to think about it, Margaret Grazioli. I said, God, that's a good choice. I should have thought of that myself. So, you know, here, 25 years later, or whatever, 24 years later, here I am presenting Margaret Presley with a Citizen of the Year award. Another 25 years down the line, the mayor approaches me and says, I need somebody to go on the, the library board. I said, okay, no, no problem. He says, when do you want me to start? How about in two weeks? <laughs> so here I come over to the library board and I've sort of gotten involved here. I've been president for the last two years now. Unfortunately, the library at Plaza Center was lacking handicapped accessibility. The children's department was completely inaccessible. It was heartbreaking to explain this to children who wanted to use their library. I didn't always get parking. I had to park across the street. Um, in the Then used to be Acme. So uh, I had to carry him up. So that was more difficult for me. But carrying down the steps, it, it was hard. He was getting bigger and bigger when he went to the library school. He was there until age five, I think three to five. There was no preschool yes. program then. And uh, mm, uh, so it was difficult sometimes, with, especially with books, with um, um, carrying him. The little one was still little. They were two and a half years apart. So. It, but we managed. Uh, the thing was we used to love to come to the library. Yeah. So, so how does it feel now to come into this library and see it fully handicapped accessible? Yeah, it, it is great. Uh, both my sons come home for, you know, holidays, for, you know, when they have time off. And it seems like the library is a must stop. They have to come here. They love to come here. And, and uh, my younger son has told me, oh, I used to love the books. I used to love the smell of the books. So uh, they still come to smell the books, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. The library was a lot of fun. And uh, growing up, I think it's very important. And uh, 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 one thing I do remember, I, I told you about the Hardy Boys books. They used to read the Hardy Boys. So they used to have a fight who read, gets to read first. So I uh, implemented this uh, uh, rule that they have to get two books each time. And they have to read their own book and then switch. And the funny part is, I used to die to read those books myself. Uh. So when they were not looking, I would read them. Uh, they learned to uh, do research here. Those were days that internet was not accessible. Even now, I feel the physical books, uh, is, you know, you cannot really, um, I have a, you know, I read books online, but uh, the physical, like holding a book has a, a different meaning to, to us all, actually them too. The CAS, which stands for Community Art Scholarship Theater, uh, got started because all of the other theaters had stopped. It was no longer community theater. 
the uh, church lost their director, the priest was moved out of town, and the high school had decided that they just couldn't afford it. So those three avenues were closed. So I called up Joan Kashuba, a mm -hmm. long time friend of mine, and um, we decided we would at least attempt to start a community theater group. So she called a friend on the Board of Education, and I called the mayor, at that time was Paul Amigo. And in those days, both bodies had what they uh, called a recreation department. So there was budgets under those headings. Yes. And they um, agreed to sponsor us. Both bodies agreed to sponsor us. So that's, where, that's why we were able to get started. Where the library comes in is uh, we needed an office space. We needed Xerox machines. We needed a piano. Oh yes, that old all, piano. All of that, and in, and then and that the library was attached to the firehouse. Yes, and it had moved from the original library, which we can talk about in a moment. And um, I don't know that we could have functioned as long as we had, because that was in the 80s. Now we're talking about yes, 2014, right. so it's been a long time. And uh, we just had nothing but cooperation. I remember um, when we first said that we were going to add technology to the library, no one believed us, including you. <laughs> there were little doubting Thomases there. And I understand why there was nobody really at that time who had any technical skills other than yourself. No. Yeah. So you knew what was going to fall upon you if this happened. Um, and of course, we had another employee, Kevin. Yes. Tell us yeah. about Kevin. And Kevin, yeah, he was the uh, Kevin Chacon. He was the other person in the library at the time. He handled the computers as well. Unfortunately, we lost him. But you saw changes in everything. Changes in administration and the community, changes of directors, changes uh, in the town, the technology, and even the number of books that we had yes. here compared to what yes. you knew before. Yes, yep. Circulation used to be, you know, if we checked out 2,000, when I first started, if we checked out 2,000 books, that was a lot. Now we're doing 10,000, yeah. Right. And it's a, a large difference than when I first started. When I first started, we were using a little rubber stamp to check books out. Right. Now, you don't even do that anymore. The computer does it all for you. Explain a little bit of uh, the buckle system to me. Uh, it's a group of libraries compiled together into a database, which uh, each library has access to. Each individual library can request books from those libraries. They can request books from us. They also offer databases as well. Uh, and now with more technology, you got the e-books with Kindles and Nooks and iPads, you can download a book to that now too, uh, and it just continues to build each each year, you got more new technology coming out. Uh, when I first started, we started with videotapes, mm. now we've got DVDs. What's next? Who knows? I was the literacy coordinator for the Secaucus Public Library in 2001 by your time in 2013. However, I've been with the literacy program at the library from its inception in 1993. It began when a woman who, unfortunately, whose name I don't recall, a Rotarian, who worked for Hearts Mountain, came to the library and was telling us about a literacy program in her community and would we be interested. Well, Margaret Grazioli was the director, Kathy Stephens, her assistant, and I was involved with projects at the library, although I was the associate editor of the Sea Caucus Home News, I did library PR, and to make a long story short, we jumped on it and said, we should all do this, we should get involved to help people in basic reading, that is how the Sea Caucus Literacy Program began, helping people with basic reading and comprehension. Uh, it was not an ESL program as it is today. We soon learned that LVA, Literacy Volunteers of America, was a, a lot about forms and dues and forms and dues, and we decided we should not go with them and we should just do our own thing. So from 1993 to today, we have been winning the Sikh Orcus Literacy Program and it is so successful. 
We have the best supplies for readers. We, are, we also do basic reading for people with comprehension skills, but we have a huge ESL program. We have materials, but that's the books and, and that's the hardware part of it. Let me tell you about the people. The people who tutor, they just come forward from all walks of life, of life and of, with all kinds of background, educational backgrounds, uh, no educate, no secondary education, just a willingness to help people. And, and they do such a remarkable, it's just an amazing program and it doesn't take much except a willingness to help. The Library Board of Trustees contribute their personal expertise and judgment to the decision-making process necessary for the sound governance of the library amid the climate of change and possibility. When the new library opened about 1959 in Plaza Center, I was there on opening day because I could not wait to see our brand new library and it was not a disappointment. You walked into this big, beautiful, bright um, area nothing like it had been. Shelves and shelves of books and bright and airy and especially the, I love the, the bay window in the back where you could just, it was a window seat and you could go and take out books and sit there and read. And we actually, with my friends, it became a social place. We went there after school, but we didn't just, you know, gossip and kibitz. We actually did homework. We took books out. We read some of our books there. And we actually did reference work there because we had no internet at that time and we used the encyclopedias. And you always hoped that when you went, the volume you wanted was there. It was not, you know, missing or used by somebody else. But not to worry, there were always other encyclopedia there that you could take um, one of the volumes from. And it was at that library that um, I actually was, um, became a member of the library board. And that was quite a thrill for me to be um, a member of the board of trustees in that library where I just, I grew up basically in that library. And it's that library where our library board hoped and planned and dreamed and saved money um, for the day when we would be able to have a brand new library in whatever shape or form. We did not know at that time. Uh, but we were hoping that something would come to fruition. And of course, um, we were, we were um, fortunate that when I was um, on the library board that Tony Just, Mayor Just, uh, told us that we would be, that he and the town council had decided it was time that the library would be um, able to expand and remodel. And that was a thrill for us. Mm -hmm. I remember your excitement mm -hmm. at that council meeting mm -hmm. that night. And when, and when um, Dennis Elwell became mayor, and he and the town council at that point said that we could, they passed the resolution, as you said, that we would not only remodel and expand, but that we would um, build a brand new state-of-the-art library on the, on the current on premises on Patterson Plank Road. She used to take me to the, um, the old library that was upstairs in the old uh, municipal building, mostly because I love climbing the spiral steps to go upstairs. Okay, there's that controversial set of stairs again. Well, I mean, I remember that, and I remember the quiet signs, you weren't allowed to talk. That's but I, right. But I also remember Mrs. Dudley, who was the sweetest person. Of course, you know, as I became older, I was living right next door to my aunt, so she was always involved with the library. And I was always involved because we went to library school for what we call library school, mm -hmm. story hour. And I guess it, she was just a big influence on me. Well, Mayor Amico, uh, I was his secretary temporarily while his other secretary was sick. We were talking about the library at the time, and I told him how happy I was to see that we were getting a new library. And he says, you know, I was thinking of putting you on the board. He said, would you like to do that? I said, sure. I said, I'm new in town. I would like to meet a lot of new people, you know, just to get to know the, uh, how the town is and the friendliness of the people, which was beautiful. I 
everybody. It was such a friendly town. I think of when I first became a trustee, and I think it was in the year 1995, at the old library. And I liked that old library. The charm of the outside and the inside was very, very lovely. But then we were on a mission to find a new library, or build a new library, which eventually we did in the year 2003. And my thoughts at that time were, how is this going to work? Will it be as charming and comfortable as the old library? And I know that Kathy Stephens as our director would make it that way. But um, needless to say, we, we did build a new library. And on that first day in January, we had a beautiful gathering that day. He was a chemistry person. And he loved chemistry, and he followed that. But when he retired, he thought there was no more for chemistry for him, and he wanted to dedicate himself to education. And that's why he really thought he would be building the uh, new, li uh, new uh, library here. And that's what he dedicated himself to, education. I think he's got a feeling of satisfaction, of seeing a dream become a reality and having the fruition of what our vision was. He can certainly sit back and say it was a job well done yes. because he worked diligently and on I, this And library. I wanted to say I so clearly recall tapping into my children. I, I'm, I'm great for volunteering other people's services like my dad, but I remember when that move came and how we had to adopt a bookshelf. Yes. And everybody gave their, their shelf a title and we were responsible for boxing and bagging, bringing it over, then re, you know, setting it up in this new facility. And it became a family affair. And as many of the things that, that opportunities allowed us to involve the children and, and family members, uh, that was one that clearly sticks out in my mind, that big move and getting the family involved, making it a, an event that excited about and uh, glad to see come to fruition. The Friends of the Library was established in 1997 and quickly became a 501c3 organization and began their fundraising. At the time of the dedication of the Patterson Plank Road Library, they had raised over $200,000, which was donated to the town to offset the costs of construction. They are a dynamic organization of spirited volunteers who represent the true residents of Secaucus. We searched for a president who would lead us to success in our goal of assisting the library to be the educational, informational, and recreational hub of the community. We didn't have to look too far when we asked you if you would fill that position. What was it like to be president of this new dynamic club? Well, first of all, I considered it an honor. And I considered it a responsibility, having been elected the first president. I felt that I had to set a standard. No one said I had to do anything like that, but that was something I felt was important. Set the standard for other presidents to follow and other members to follow. But I knew I would not be able to do it alone. So I sought help from the community and working with you as librarian who is very important, I felt, for us to bring programs into the building to let them know we were more than just a library. We were a community resource. Now, one of the things that I felt we did to bring community members in was to run the programs. We ran the program about the history of Sea Caucus. We brought in a lot of older residents who brought in old maps and diagrams, and they talked about these things. And I think they were honored that we felt that was an important thing to bring to our community resource. Then to bring history, because the library services all areas. We brought in veterans from the wars. And how many people really knew how many of our men and women were in World War II? How many were captured? How many were wounded? I mean, I don't think we knew all of that. I knew some of it. I always remember the sign we had in front of the municipal building where the original library was that listed all of our servicemen. Yes. And saw the, remember the gold stars that mm -hmm. were there and the names of the streets. So I think that by bringing in programs like that and then 
inviting the history classes from the high school to go down and see the displays because these gentlemen had brought back a lot of the awards. Oh, and not awards, but things they had treasured because they found bayonets and objects from the different uh, allies and objects from the Axis, you know, that we fought against. So I thought that that was good too because whether they got something from the display or not, as the history teachers spoke to them, they saw that this was, this was World War II. We were involved. Everybody was involved. Little children were involved in their schools by bringing a newspaper and such. So this way the young people got to meet those who had fought in the war to help us, to save us. And I think that was the kind of program we ran that I thought went very well because it brought in different people to the library and they found out what the resources were. So I think that that was important. The continuation of the mini fair I thought was important. At the time I was president, we were in the library in the center of town and we had our mini fair out in the grounds of Buckmellow Park and in the library too. So I think that that was the thing that I felt I fulfilled my responsibility and I felt working with the library, yourself and the staff, you know, we were able to achieve a great deal. And I think back to when our, you know, first days and I know that we did so many fundraising efforts uh, to raise money for the library, but I do remember so many of the wonderful programs. We tried to have programs for people of all ages, whether it was the children up to the seniors. We've always managed to have programs. I, I have a listing of so many of the wonderful things that we have done. Um, I so clearly like to comment that we deal with and we address the past, the present, and the future. With the past, we've remembered the World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam Veterans War. With things that were going on in the current day, we certainly have many programs and certainly look into the future with um, technology. That's quite a challenge. And yes, I can honestly and proudly say that we are keeping up with technology and afford the community and its members the opportunity to make use of the many, many programs and uh, learning experiences that can be had here. But we had so many wonderful programs. I remember so clearly the, uh, the lovely evening, which um, was a piano player, we had all kinds of different desserts, we had the Irish step dancers. You know, our purpose or our mission was to uh, improve, support, and enhance the library as a cultural, educational, and informational center or uh, hub of our community. And we so did that in so many ways, but especially the programs that were offered for all ages, for all generations. Uh, and we've got it and we continue to do so. Friends of the Library is a volunteer group of people who want to enhance programs for the library. We do fundraisers, we sponsor programs, and to keep the community informed about what is going on at the library itself. We sponsor um, concerts during the year. Um, We've had um, an anti growth show, which was very successful. We've had um, Amanda Freitag here, and she's done a demonstration and answered questions. We've had sort of educational kind of uh, informative groups. Very important that the friends support what the town does and the town supports the library does. That's, that's very true. The book club has broadened my reading habits. Um, we have about 12 people. Um, a lot of older, older residents in the terms of how many years you've taught here and a lot of new people who have moved into Harmon Cove area. And it's a joy reading the book and discussing it because we have diversified opinions. But everybody appreciates everybody else's opinion. So I have known, I've got many new friends. I've broadened my reading habits. I have no, well, I never did have any qualms about offering an opinion, <laughs> but I think everybody who's a member feels, I can offer my opinion here in this reading club. And if I didn't understand something without criticism, I can say, well, I didn't quite get that. What did you see in there? And it's a wonderful experience just exploring.
it which is. I will continue to do forever. It has lasted, I guess, so almost 10 years now, the book club. And um, we have 12 or 13 people, which is just a very nice size because everybody gets to talk. And um, some of the ladies even wish we would meet two times a week. Two uh, times uh, a uh, month, money. I should say. Mm -hmm. But um, that's pushing it for a lot of people who have many other things that they have to do. But we are the afternoon book club and we haven't stopped. I also started last year and it'll pick up again in January, uh, a movie club, which is sponsored by the Friends. And it's like a book club, showing a movie and discussing it. And movies, already kind of movies that we wouldn't normally get in Secaucus, but that there are people that would like to see them and just can't get to New York or to Montclair to see these movies. So. Right. Mayor Dennis Elwell and the town council later determined that a new state-of-the-art, fully handicapped, accessible library would be built on Patterson Plank Road. Ironically, it took 20 years to complete that goal. We sat down and we talked about a new library. Uh, there had been some thoughts uh, by the former mayor that on this site we would build a new firehouse and community room. Uh, there was some councilman that thought that that would be a good idea too. But at the same time, the library was still would have been stuck with eight parking places and certainly was not handicap assessment. And, and probably in the design of the building, it would have cost more money to make it handicap accessible than it would have cost to move in the building. So we, we asked for permission to hire an architect to come in and look at this site here and come up with something. Once uh, they, the, the council saw the rough sketch of what we would do and what it would look like, uh, they all came all over the wrong way. There were some people that thought that you didn't need a library. Computers were coming in, uh, people were actively reading uh, books on computers and, and, and there were stories going around it. You would never go to a library again because you could sit at home and go on a screen and do whatever a library could do. Uh, I met one, one lady uh, in the campaign and I asked her her opinion of uh, a new library. And, and this lady did not have a lot of money, so she would, could have been typically someone who said, don't spend money. And her remark to me was, Dennis, good towns have good libraries. And that sort of convinced me, because I always thought this was a wonderful town and a great town. And, and we should have something, and it, it shouldn't be shared with anyone else. It should be the libraries and libraries. On September 11th, the, I think the whole country began to realize that we were vulnerable. And uh, we had, I, I believe it was six people from Sea Corpus, or, and, and one may have just shortly moved away, but had ties right. to Sea Corpus. Um, when you read all of the different things that were going on, and the talks about memorials and what people were going to do, um, I had the administrator get in touch with John Capazzi, who actually designed this building, and, and asked that something be designed, something solemn, because it was a very solemn day. Yes. And um, he designed what's out there. You know, my only request was that I thought it would be proper to be in black marble. I picked black mm -hmm. marble because the Vietnam Memorial was black marble, and that seemed to be very, and it's very striking to people. Uh, I might add, I believe we were the first, I know we were the first community in Hudson County, but may have actually been the first community in the state to erect a memorial. This was a labor of love, uh, obviously, and uh, at that time, I was, you know, which I still am the construction official, but I became something a little bit more for this project. It was more like the perk of the works to make sure everything functioned properly. Uh, I think the final product speaks for itself. Like you said, it's talked about statewide. As now in my role as the Speaker of the Assembly, I, I speak with librarians and the state librarian, librarians throughout the state, and it is known for being uh, a, a resource center. It's something that is great for the community. It's a part of education. 
that I think it's great having uh, young children at that time and knowing what the value of a library and as me taking advantage of library back then we didn't really have the internet and things at home and I was always able to be able to use it as a resource and a tool to, to get educated so I think education is a big component but being the construction official here uh, I get to oversee the construction of buildings but I sort of was giving an additional title, which was clerical works. This project, I know for you it was a labor of love, and, and that transcended to me for, to get the passion to make sure we, we had something that would be a legacy for future uh, generations. And partnering with the business community, that they are part of our community and them giving back to, into that community, it's so important because it helps the, you know, the taxpayers to offset some of the bills. And I think that that's a great, you know, we have the different rooms that are named after, whether it's the Panasonic room and things that they gave and donated. And that's great because they're giving back to the community that they're, they're part of. They, they're just daytime residents, not nighttime right. residents, but they are part of a community. They're taxpayers here and them donating and giving to a community, I think it's great. I, I think when you look at that partnership that you have with, you know, it's public-private partnerships that they invest in the future of the town, it just makes everything work together. And that's why at the state level we try and, and emphasize on public partnerships yes. that uh, really help tremendously and can help offset costs. When we were moving from the old library, it was always something I wanted to do to recognize the trustees, especially, who served throughout the years. There were so many dedicated volunteers. We were fortunate enough to discover in the attic the minutes of the meeting starting from 1934, right up until today, of course. Um, and Margaret Grazioli thought they were lost. She thought they were lost in transit from the old library in the town hall to this one. So it was a treasure trove for me. I read and I read. But once I got to this building, as they say, be careful what you wish for, there was so much work to do. And I loved every minute of it, but I didn't get a chance to read every bit of those minutes, which I'm doing now. I waited till I retired. Sorry that we didn't make the 75th, but we're making the 80th. And those minutes are charming and informative and discuss some of the trials and tribulations that the library experienced as they experience these days with the you know finances and whatever. We're so fortunate in this town, we have town fathers that agree that the library should be the center of the community. It's as important as the Board of Education, the police department, anything else people look into before they move here. Check out your libraries. And I always wore a pin that said, libraries build community. And even though it's the community that physically builds the library, it's the library that builds the community. I wanted everyone to share that. I had to revise and change and project some of the library's plans when it became absolute that the town fathers were going to build a new building. We weren't just going to be trying to enlarge the old building, which was so cozy, so warm, so wonderful, but tight. So with that in mind, I thought, let's see what we can do to incorporate the businesses. They had come to this area. They were invited to the Meadowlands, the beautiful Meadowlands, and to Sea Caucus, the jewel of the Meadowlands. But we weren't offering them anything back. And I thought, what a a partnership we could have if we did. The WWOR needed special books, they needed special materials, pictures, photos of old of old actors and actresses and someone smoking a cigar I remember one day and other businesses needed an awful lot of the uh, books that were online. The attorneys books and different materials that were too expensive for every single uh, business to purchase. So I went to them and said, we'll do this for you. We have a literacy program training your people and your uh, their spouses and 
we offer back, so you offer to us. That's how it became the Secaucus Public Library and Business Resource Center. I was terrified the night before we opened that someone would come in and say, oh, I hate the colors, I hate this, I don't like what you designed over here. Uh, and it took so much work, but it didn't happen. I'm sure there are those that wish it was done in different colors, but the basics of the library was so well accepted and the community spirit that it involved with moving the books over here uh, without hiring a corporation. There were 57,000 of them that came over here by volunteers with that Adopt-the-Shelf program that you mentioned. They took their books, they fixed them up, and if they were torn and tattered, they let us know, no, and we would uh, purchase new ones. And so that was very, very satisfying. That was really a, a great success. So this building, and having put my footprint on it, is the most rewarding experience. I learned that the library wasn't just a building where you picked up an encyclopedia or you, you went for some reference work, but I learned that it was bigger than that. It was much bigger than that, and I have to say a little thanks to you again, because I, I was more impressed how much the business community uh, involved itself in the library. And, I, and to me, that was never that way in, in the past. And it should be that way, because they're very big taxpayers in our community, and they, they hire people. And to see them come in here and have their meetings here, public service is one. I was here one day when there was a company, it might have been Costco or one of the mm -hmm. other professional companies in the community, they came over and they used the uh, television. Now they call it Skype on our phones, but they were having a conference, uh, in, I don't know if it was in China or if it was uh, the other end of the United States, I'm not quite sure. But it made me realize how important the library is, not only for us, but for the business community too. You were always so involved with the library, and I don't, before it was in fashion yes, to do so, yes. why did you do that? Well, I try to do it with everything. My, my goal is to never say no. You know, I, I, if, even if we can't do something on a large scale, do something. Always try to do something. Don't say no is a hard word for anybody to walk out the door and go, wow, I can't believe you know, Steve didn't do anything. But I have to tell you that I believe that America is built on the children. Children go to the library. Um, we provide so much more, obviously, in this library. But I always thought, I, I do have a soft spot for the kids, and I always thought I related library and children in school, maybe because that's I'm a little old school, but that's the way I was brought up. You had your library card, you went to the library, you needed a book. So I, I always felt that the uh, library was always a fair and safe haven for the kids. And, uh, and that's basically how I started, you know, donating. You started donating uh, with our summer reading programs. Mm -hmm. And you've continued that from the old library yes. to this library. So that's mm -hmm. almost 20 years now that you've yes. been doing this. Yes. Of how many readers have gone through the summer? We, we so get many. so many every year, yes. but they all eat the Steve Natoli pizza, the pizza at the end. Yes, that's their reward. Isn't that a wonderful Absolutely. feeling? Absolutely. I hope for as long as they're reading, they're eating Natoli's pizza. <laughs> I did a program uh, lecture series on Cezanne and Van Gogh, uh, Monet. Um, I did soap spring workshops. Um, I really liked getting, you know, the hope for the future is in the, is in the I, I feel, is in the minds of the young kids. And I liked the workshop uh, that we had for the uh, children, where we went out into nature. We, it was an environmental art workshop. And I asked them, we were going to go to Schmidt's Woods. And we took the buses there, loaded the kids up. And they were supposed to only take with them things that they had a personal response to, they had a feeling for when they saw them. Could have been a rock, could have been a branch, could have been ripped off tree bark, it could have been a, a chunk of a tree, um, I don't know, it could have been a flower, a weed, a, a rusted piece of metal, 
anything that they found and that they were to come back, and I gave them plastic bags and they were to kind of load the bag up with not just one thing, but many things. And then they came back here and we had all these, remember we had these plastic bags? Oh, yes. Loaded with what to ordinary eyes would look like. Just let's get it to the DPW. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, uh, Kathy, next week we're going to be laying these bags out all over the floor and the kids are going to be throwing their stuff out. And next week came and they did and they sat in the middle of their, of their gathered little artifacts, so to speak, you know, rocks and branches and rust and cans and whatever. And they had to create something with it. And it was beautiful, rusted wire and uh, cord. And, and they made these things. They made these things and it looked like something you'd see at the Museum of Natural History. David Valka, who was a sick office resident at the time, and, uh, 12 years ago, recruited me for the SCORE organization. I was sort of, uh, I retired early, and uh, I wasn't interested in doing it. I, I, I paid my dues to the town of Seacock. So anyway, David Mocker recruited me for SCORE. SCORE is a national organization. It's sponsored by the United States Small Business Administration. And actually, SCORE stands for Senior Counselors of Retired Executives. And what SCORE does is provide free, which is very key, free business counseling for people who uh, are interested in going into business or people who are already in business. They may need a marketing plan, they may need a business plan, they may need a small business loan. We don't do any work, we don't have any money, we don't make any loans, we don't have any grants, but it's a free service that you can come to the library and spend an hour with a counselor and get some, some good resource material and some good advice. And actually, what happened, uh, as you know, Kathy, when David Malcolm and I approached you, we thought that uh, the library would be a good place for seat parkers to offer this service or for score. And of course, which is always cooperative from the seat parkers library, absolutely, we'll work it out somehow. And we started this service in the old library. And now we run it out here, so the Hudson County, and we provide counseling service in Spanish and English. And we have six counselors, and we do counseling at the Jersey City Library, Kearney, North Bergen, Union City, and Hoboken. My impressions about all the filming that we've done, certain subjects have been repeatedly brought into the interviews. First one, staircase to the old library. Two schools on that, you already know where I'm going. I am of the straight wooden staircase school. There are people who insist it was a spiral staircase and that it was metal and that it still exists in the firehouse. I don't believe that. If it was, it was later or it was like an emergency access to the back of the library. That staircase in the old town hall was straight up one flight, across the hall, straight up the other flight, and there was the door. Um, like I said, I sat outside that door on numerous occasions waiting for Ms. Mrs. Dudley to come up the stairs. I could be wrong, I was a child, but there were enough people that we interviewed and people whose memories I respect, because I know some of them, and I know their memory for detail, that back me up on this. Right. By the same token, there are other people who insist, and I don't know the people, so I can't say for sure, that there was a, a metal spiral staircase. Absolutely as sure as I am about the straight wooden staircase, and all the creaking that it made and everything, they are about the metal staircase. And a metal staircase, I think I would remember because walking up, you would hear the metal tapping. I have no recollection of that. I'm sticking with the Good. wooden we'll staircase. Remain a mystery. Yes. The other thing that has crept into 80% of the interviews is the technology. And I said it many times after the interviews when we sat and discussed what was said. I'm a book person. I want the book in my hand. I have no use for a nook. 
I have no use for any sort of electronic information media. Yes, I do use the computers here. Um, I use it for email. I use it to look things up. I have to look a few things up today. I don't have internet access at home. This is the most convenient place. I will either bring my laptop here and go on the Wi-Fi, which is iffy at times, or I'll just register and use a computer. But as far as checking out the, um, the nooks or buying one myself and downloading books, I have no use for that. I want to feel the pages. I'm a book collector. And I do remember that building and how sensational that building was with the spiral staircase. And uh, I, I remember that building well. As a kid, we used to play in the back and, and uh, visit the police department frequently. And, it was a great space, but you know, I was always of the opinion, and, and, and throughout my career, I, and I still am as mayor, I think that all the agencies should work together. Even though we, we may be separate autonomous agencies, we're really all one town. Um, so I was a big advocate then, as I am now, of doing anything I can to not only promote the library, but to help the library with different events, like events that you put together, the mini fair. Uh, I thought it was important for for the town to help you guys to make sure that those events really were as successful as they could be. And, and since you started to where we are today, it's grown and grown and grown. It's become quite the community event that people wait for each and every year. So I think it's it was really important. And I always took it, um, I always take things personal. And I feel if you don't get involved, sometimes things just don't work out the way they should. And not only from an economic standpoint, where we could save you a lot of money by helping you, and no matter how you look at it, whether it's the Board of Education, the town, the Swords Authority, the library, it's all the same tax dollar. So wherever we can save that kind of money, put that kind of effort forward to make things better, um, I think that's what it's all about. It also doubles as a, a community shelter. And um, we just received a grant actually to put a generator, a natural gas power generator in the power of this and the OEM, which is kind of close by. But we've used this building during Hurricane Irene, Hurricane Sandy, where we had to actually put place people in place where they couldn't stay in their homes. And quite frankly, look around. What better place would you want to be in if you couldn't be home? So um, this building does a lot, and this building really stands as a, a symbol of what the community is all about. The time that we went through with both those storms that we just spoke about, having the ability to have a room like the Panasonic room. And I know it did go on a little longer than we mm -hmm. would have liked it to. Um, number one, it gave us an upper hand, the people from people who are right in our community to service our residents and the town. And it was a great place to host them. Absolutely. You know, we've collected since Hurricane Sandy, my last check this morning, close to $500,000. And a lot of that was done by communicating with people that were here, telling us what to do, telling us how to approach issues. So when you have that one-on-one -on -one contact and you're not talking over a telephone or, or taking a one-day trip to South Jersey, I could have came here six, seven times a day and they were here. So you're seeing a lot of different cultures and, and, and people come here, and for good reason. Um, a lot of people that come here work in Manhattan. A lot of people that come here are professionals. The thing that I like to see about it is a lot of people that are coming here now and they're buying homes and they're making this their home and they're people that have families and children. And we're seeing a lot of children and we're seeing a lot of different uh, cultures. Listen, the Asian population in Secaucus is growing. Those children are really geared towards education. If I had a, I, I'm going to tell you a quick short story, but I had. 35 kids from Korea here uh, last week for a week. I had to keep them busy every day. So we did the pool, we did the rec salon, we did the dinosaur park. One day I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to take you to the police department. We're going to talk about local government. We're going to visit a firehouse. And then we're going to go see the public library. Well, they went to all those places that day. And at the end of the day, what was the most exciting thing that they did? It was here. They came here, they didn't want to leave. But those children in Korea, just using that as an example, they go to school at 7.30 in the morning, they come home at 
they have dinner and they go back to school. And in the American culture, you know, we're a little bit different. And having those type of students now in our school system, I think, allows our kids to become a lot more competitive. Um, you know, the valedictorians, the valedictorians and the salutatorians have been to a lot of graduations. Um, they're kids from different countries. And I think that our children, as they become educated, you know, hand in hand with them, we're going to pick up a little bit on that. And quite frankly, when they get to colleges, we can have the best students in the world here. Um, when you get to a college, well, the best students in our system, when you get to college, that all changes. And I think the competitiveness of these other, being with these other kids is really important. Not only is it important in school, but when they graduate and go look for a job, they're going to be competing against the same kids. So, listen, I, when, I, when you talk about culture, I think it's wonderful. And I think it's wonderful that, the, that our kids, we didn't get to experience that as children. And that they're experiencing it. They're meeting kids from all over the world. They're learning all different cultures. Nothing but positive things could come out of that. Um, I started when I was uh, 18 years old. Um, I worked summers here as a library page, as a summer worker, while I was in college. Um, basically, I worked two shifts on most days. I worked a morning shift in the children's department with the um, extended story hour program that we run in the summertime. And then I would take a couple hours off and come back and do like a late afternoon or a night shift. Um, and that was upstairs in the adult circulation area, uh, working at shelving books and, and doing light clerical work. Um, I didn't think I was going to become a librarian. Uh, I, that wasn't my, my plan, but um, I really loved it. I, I fell in love with, with the library, with the Sea Caucus Library, and um, with, with you know, librarianship. Um, and uh, yeah, I ended up um, changing. Actually, Kathy Stephens had at one point called me into her office and asked me if I was going to consider getting an MLS. And I was embarrassed to tell her at the time that I didn't even know what an MLS was. <laughs> Uh, it's a master's in library science. Um, and I said, no, I'll think about that. And I wasn't going to really think about it. But then I found myself in the library more and more. I was at the library in Sea Caucus. I was working uh, at my college library up in Massachusetts. And um, even when I was doing my student teaching, I was hanging out in the school library all the time. So it, it just clicked, and it was right. So when I graduated college in 2001, I went directly into grad school at Rutgers and um, got my MLS in uh, the uh, winter of 2003. Um, fortunately, that lined up perfectly with the opening of this new library building. And um, I started my first day as a full-time librarian at the reference desk in this building, uh, January 4th, 2003. Um, I was uh, head of reference for uh, about five years. And uh, when Kathy retired in 2000, early 2009, I became library director and I've been director now for almost six years. Memories for me is it's the building during Hurricane Sandy. Um, we were closed on the day that Sandy started, I believe that was on Monday, and uh, at about 1235 on Monday night I got a phone call uh, from Lou Minervini, uh, who is the uh, head of maintenance here at the library, saying that the building was going to be opening as an emergency shelter and that they needed people to, to man it, to man the desk and to be here. So um, because I, at the time, only lived a couple blocks away, an emergency vehicle was sent to pick me up. And uh, Lou and I spent the entire night here as people came in. We had about 40 to 45 people mm. here the first night, including two dogs and a parrot. Oh. Um, and uh, you know, it was, it was a wild night. Um, we all were working on very little sleep. There was an awful lot going on around us. We had emergency personnel from the OEM coming in and out of the building with updates every 20 or 30 minutes. They were also coming in to kind of get refreshed, have a cup of coffee, um, see what was going on. We were fortunate enough that we kept power throughout, and we actually kept internet access with Wi-Fi throughout the um, five days that we were open. We were open for five days and nights straight. Um, we were not open as a library, however. Uh, we were open with the intent that we we're providing emergency service, so um, we didn't we didn't have an internet line to check books out. But somewhere around day two or so, we decided to let people take books out anyway on honor system, uh, and you know they came back. Um, pe people were really at their best during 
crisis. Um, it was a very traumatic night, but I think that we served a really important role in the community. We had several people who had told us that they had never been in the library before that night. Um, and I, I, I hope that you know maybe they found the library a welcoming place and that it encouraged them to come back in the future under better circumstances. One thing I'd like to say is that if you're watching this 30 years from now and you're in a library and you're wondering if libraries are always going to be there and if they're always going to be relevant, we're wondering the same thing. And 30 years ago they were wondering the same thing. Um, libraries will always be relevant to the community. They're always going to be at the heart of the community, I, I believe. Um, and um, my other thing is that I always think of our library by a title of a book that's here in this building. And the book is by Elizabeth Berg and it's called We Are All Welcome Here. And to me, that's the core of the library. The library is a place where everyone is welcome, regardless of your age, regardless of your background, regardless of, of why you're here to use the library. It's a welcoming space. It, it's a space of acceptance and tolerance and hopefully a community. Um, where we're trying to build a community here. It, it's the heart of a larger community, but it also is a community within itself. And, um, we, we hope that everyone always feels welcome. This is the most controversial set of stairs ever. They exist. They don't exist. When the old town hall was demolished for the new, members of Engine and Company No. 1 disassembled this staircase and reinstalled it in their quarters at Plaza Center. 